Is it because he kisses his, uh, his, his bicep, Kaepernick does? Is that why you don't like no, him? No, but now I don't like him even more now you because seen you him? told me he that. Kisses, he kisses no, his bicep. No, that's his, I don't know. That's I just, a celebration. I feel like, I feel a part of me, and it's bad, and it's probably totally wrong, but part of me just feels like it's the team around him that got him there. Like he's good. Yeah, but he was running over motherfuckers. That's bad, true. That's you know? true. I mean, he was running all over, but you know, when you have a running back like Frank Gore, who's an absolute beast, you true. know, I mean, then you have him who can run. I mean, then you have your wide receivers. I mean, you got Dave, Vernon Davis. Mm-hmm. You got, I mean, Crabtree. Yeah. I mean, you look he's at. He's got ba- a good team. You look at Baltimore. But, yeah. You know, as far as receivers, they don't have the same weapons. You know. Mm-hmm. Bolden. But Bolden. That's it. Yeah. You know. Most of their most of their work. But Flacco's got a gun. Oh, and they got Torrey Smith. That's true. That's yeah, true. But still, I mean, be. I don't know. I just feel like overall, I think Flacco is a better like quarterback. Yeah, pocket quarterback. Yeah. Kaepernick tried to throw some interceptions last week. Like he tried to throw a couple, and the Falcons dropped him. I think that's what's going to be the difference. I think he's going to throw a couple picks. I think it's going to be close. I think he's a stud. But I think the Ravens are just a little too experienced. It's almost like you have to warm up to win in something that big, I feel like. You know, like I just don't think they're ready. Well, on experience. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can say what you want, but experience, you can't replace the experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know. I just feel like I, I think the reason why is I think Cap- I, feel, I look at Kaepernick as another form of Tebow. It's just he can throw the ball better. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. He does not want to hear that. No, no, I Kaepernick know. Kaepernick does not want to hear that he's another form of Tebow. No, I know, but, but would you not agree with me? I, I hope mean, he's not listening right now. Yeah, he, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really like you. <laughs> um, well, we're here live at the Warrior Poet Project with my man Kane Wasilinchuk. That's it. All right, I got it. Who is arguably, and maybe not even arguably, the most dominant athlete in his sport in the modern era. And you're saying, no way. How come I've never heard of this dude? That's impossible. How have I not heard of the most dominant athlete in his sport in the modern era? It's because his sport is racquetball, which is an awesome sport. But yes. people just don't give enough of a shit. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think that's a little bit of an <laughs> understatement. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah. So what's your, uh, what's your record like here, man? You've got like seven world championships. When was... Is that is that right? How many world championships? I got got? seven world championships. Um, January would have been January fourth was exactly four years since I lost. Four years since you lost. Yeah, you know, actually, now that I just said it, it, you know, I I, I'm still in it, so it's hard for me to think outside (laughs) the box like that. But when I just said it, I was like, four years. Like, I did a lot of stuff in four years outside of racquetball, and I mean. It's a long time. It's a long time. It is a long so how time. many matches do you play a year? Uh, I mean, we're talking 12 tournaments. I would say probably at least 100 matches. I mean, give or take. Yeah. Somewhere in there. I mean, <laughs> 100 matches. And, you know, the thing is, is people aren't really even that close. Like when we're out of these out of this run of you know 400 matches over four years, I mean, are there any, were there any real super close calls that you had to deal with here? Or? Yeah, there was a couple. I mean, you know, it's so funny because if you think about, you know, people look at, oh, he hasn't lost for four years. He never plays bad. But it's really not the case. I mean, there's times that I've played bad. And, um, you know, this last tournament in January, I mean, now, granted, no excuses, but I had a little bit of body issues going on. Mm-hmm. And that went a little closer than what I wanted. But before that, it was been, it had been like... I don't even know, two and a half years since it was like even close. Like yeah. usually, I mean, you have to play a best of five to 11 win by two. So first one who wins three games. And I mean, two years ago was my best year. I only lost three games the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was my best year of my whole career. And, you know, though I'm still undefeated, I mean, it was a, uh, it was just a magical year for me. Yeah. So, that I mean to put that I mean any other racket sport doesn't even 
nothing even close to that happens. I mean, tennis all the time. You see some dominant runs where people haven't given up a set in a couple months. Or... Yeah, Djokovic last year, didn't he have like something like 40 wins in a row? Yeah, and I mean, yeah, that was all yeah, over yeah, Sports Center, run. you know? Yeah, but he's a hero. Yeah. I mean, people and, are waving flags. And here I am know. at home looking got, at him. He's got lines that look like Disneyland for people yeah. trying to blow him, men yeah. and women, like whatever. You know? You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And here I am at home <laughs> looking at this saying, this is bullshit. <laughs> 40 Five? I won 45 in four tournaments. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and the prize money is a little different. Oh, it's a little. <laughs> a, li- <laughs> a little. Do you know how much those, those uh, what do you get from winning Wimbledon these days? Oh, gee. Uh, way more than what I get. Probably, <laughs> probably 50, 75% more than what I get. Well, you're way underestimating I mean, that. They got to be making, they're making millions. Yeah, millions. you know, honestly, and I don't know. And, and I'm going to say, 1.5 million for first? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean. That's a big difference. What I win in a weekend is probably the cost of a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they pay for your trip the next time yeah. you come out. Yeah. They're like free entry fee to the world championship. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about maybe just calling Djokovic up or Federer and asking if they want to sponsor me personally, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. So what is it? I mean, racquetball's high intensity, high action. Why is it that you think it hasn't quite captured the mainstream viewing, you know, kind of competitive element like uh, tennis has, for example? Well, I think, you know, I think that it's not really it's not really television friendly. I mean, uh, too fast. It's just there's so much happening on the court that. It's really, you know, you need like eight cameras and Mm -hmm. those cameras are switching every second to try and get the best angle. And I mean, even we were just recently on the tennis channel uh, over Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. and even I was watching it going, where did that ball go? Like, (laughs) I mean, so if I'm doing it, the average person is not going to have a clue, which in my, you know, I I think that it discourages them from watching, you know, and um, of course we're playing like. I mean, most people want to call it a box, but it's actually called a court. <laughs> box, I hear that a lot. Box, it's a box, right. you know, and I don't yeah. like that. I don't like that term because I, the visual that I get from a box is just not, you know. What's but, wrong with the visual of a box, Kane? What are you trying well, to not say? That are, you type trying of to, box, are you trying so. to come out? Are you trying to come out and say some things to our audience here? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've established Kane doesn't like a vision of a box, yeah. so he prefers the court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that went way, way out of the way of where that's I really want. That's what we try and do here. That's on okay. That's okay. We try and I get to the bottom to keep, of secrets. Yeah, you know? don't catch me off guard with that <laughs> one. You know? um, but I think that's the and then obviously the way that it's promoted. Yeah. Um, you know, I I think that uh, most companies and especially obviously with the economy the way it is, you know, they want to see a return. And you know, for us, it's hard to give them a return because we're. I mean, we don't really have a lot of money to start off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so a lot of the getting, you know, the, the, the TV and all that stuff costs money. Right. I mean, I think that there was, we were looking at an ESPN spot and for like a 15 minute spot, it was like $10,000 or some stupid thing. Like mm-hmm. it was, you know, I, don't quote me on that, but it was something ridiculous yeah. like that. And I mean, you know, we, we, we're having a hard time getting tournaments, right. you know, for Ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Right. So, you know, that's another problem too. Is that someone that's going to come in and promote the sport and sponsor the sport? I mean, you know, they got to be willing to put some money into it to try and get it to that next level. Right. Um, as far as the players, I mean, it's probably one of the fastest sports in the world. You know, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, how so? How fast is that ball moving on a you know full out stroke? Well, I have speed. I, I know I'm a little bigger. I kind of grew up a little bit and filled up a little bit, <laughs> filled out a little bit. So, you know, I, I probably hit the ball a little harder than the last time I was clocked. But uh, um, I was at 172 on my forehand miles an hour and uh, 161 on my backhand. Wow. That's so, incredibly fast. And, and then to imagine that it's bouncing at angles off walls with spins. Yeah. You're trying to follow an inch off the ground is ridiculous. So, yeah. But I mean, you know, I've been playing since I was two years old. So it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's a very it's a pretty popular sport to play. Like participation is still, I feel like, pretty popular. It just hasn't taken off that viewership role. And it probably is because it's too fast. Well, and, and uh, I think that the there's pers- not enough courts that are clear 
either. I, and I agree that the, the, not every court, the court that we play at the U.S. Open is four wall glass. Mm -hmm. So we have the capability of putting those cameras there. But when we travel just to these local clubs all around the U.S. and play, sometimes their courts aren't, you know, kind of camera friendly, so to speak. You know, you yep. can only have one camera. I mean, we have IRTnetwork.com, which streams all of our matches live, but... I mean, the quality, I mean, of course, isn't... Sure, if you're streaming, trying to stream something that's going 172 miles an hour, Yeah. good luck. Yeah, yeah, luck. so, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to be easy, you know, yeah. and uh, for me, I'm not going to lie, it's been a little bit frustrating because um, I've always felt that with what I'm doing could propel the sport, um, and one of my goals when I first started the tour was I wanted to make racquetball a million dollar sport. Mm -hmm. Now, whether I made that million dollars or not, I mean, I would prefer if I did, but right. you know, just propel the sport to the next level. And, um, you know, my response to people now is I can't do no better. Like I can't, yeah. I mean, what do you want me to do? I mean, guys? what exactly? Yeah, what yeah. do you want me to do? I mean, I can't do any better. I mean, you know, I mean, it's four <laughs> years. I mean, yeah. you tell me if I go another four years, finally something will happen. I don't, right, you know, right. But uh, so it's a little bit frustrating. So how for does me. that how does that affect your mentality now at this point? I mean, you've, you know, how do you stay motivated to be on the top when you've been on the top for so long? Well, a couple of things. I mean, you know, first and foremost is you know I have a family. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I have two wonderful, wonderful kids, and uh, I've always viewed when I walk on the court, whoever I'm playing is trying to take food out of my kid's mouth, mm -hmm. and. You know, it's just, you know, at some point in, in, I think in everybody's professional career, you know, you have to find a way to self-motivate. And, yeah. you know, that's kind of something that makes me tick, you know. I mean, thinking about, you know, having the, you know, visualizing somebody walking up to your kid and taking something from them. Yeah. You know, it, so it gets me going. And I yeah, mean. I do, you have to play those tricks with yourself. You do. You, know? I you mean, do. I know I'm nowhere near the caliber of athlete that you are. But, you know, I take my training pretty seriously. And. You know, I, I know in the MMA training and some of the, the hard, real hard workouts and sparring sessions and and uh, just the grueling times, you know, I would play tricks with myself and think about, you know, imagining four goons like trying to come mm -hmm. up and rape my girlfriend or something like that. I mean, like, well, that's a got, little extreme. I yeah, mean, that, well, I'd go I ballistic. Go, I go, exactly. <laughs> so you got to get that fire. If if you go too, if you go too heavy, like you'll start to like tear up and you'll like go in full, oh, yeah. in full like blood rage, which is fun sometimes occasionally to do. So yeah. actually, let me let me explain this to, to the guys. So if you want to go into full blood rage, which I recommend occasionally, you got to really paint that picture and you got to psych yourself up like and tell yourself, you know, in my case, I'm Aubrey, of course. So it's like, you know, Aubrey, you're going to quit. You're going to let him do that. Is that all you got? Are you going to let him do that? Is that you're going to let him rape your girlfriend? You're going to just stand there and watch because you're too fucking tired. Because you're too <laughs> tired to go another minute. You're too fucking tired. And this is going to happen. And, you know, and yeah. you build yourself into this friends and you're like, ah, and you will push yourself past the point where every cell in your body, every muscle is tingling. Your skin is on fire and you finish in total exhaustion and tears just streaming down your face. And you're like, Oh shit. Yeah, you that kind of sounds like every night with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right. I mean, it's just you have to, you know, you have to find a way to self-motivate and and also to you know, uh kind of back to the money thing a little bit. You know, it it was never really all about the money. I mean, I I was I was a pretty good hockey player in my mm -hmm. time and you know, I did have a couple of opportunities. Um not saying that I would have made it or would have done anything with it, but uh I had some opportunities, you know, at, as far as NHL teams, and um, I was playing racquetball at the time, and I just I became successful very quick. Um, yeah. Well, in when racquetball. you can see that you can be literally the best in the world, you know. And yeah, I mean, in one sport, it's you know, it seems like that's your destiny. To, well, and, to and, play I, it to a and I think degree. a big a big part of it is, I mean, I enjoy team sports. I mean, I really miss. I I've always been. I'm kind of like. Even though I'm I'm kind of laid back, I'm kind of like the Ray Lewis when I'm on a team like a, a team sport. Like mm -hmm. I'll get in your face, I'll do that. And so when I played hockey, I was right in my element with that. Mm -hmm. um, but then as I got older and I started looking at it more as like a business, you know, here I am going, yeah. But you know what? If the coach doesn't like my face or doesn't like anything about me, I'm sure. not going to play. So the benefit to racquetball was no one could tell me what I could you or make couldn't your own do. Destiny, you yeah, know. So that I mean that was appealing and. You know, my, my, uh, 
you know, my mom and dad always kind of taught me that money isn't everything, you mm-hmm. know, it may seem like a lot, but it's not, a, it's not everything. And, and, uh, if you do something that you genuinely love, then the money's not going to matter. And as long as you can make a, you know, an honest living at it, you'll, you'll be fine. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, I don't, you know, with money comes fame and with fame comes a lot of other bullshit too. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with the fact that I can go where I want, do what I want. I don't have people hiding in the bushes, taking pictures of me. Right. Um, though it might be a little bit flattering at the beginning, <laughs> right. but you know, I'm sure that it gets, you know, just a little bit much for everyone. So, um, it's kind of like one of those things, you know, like just beware of what you wish for. You never know. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, I'm not rich by any means, but, uh, you do have a sick car. I just bought a sick car and I love it. And, uh, you know, I yeah. don't, maybe I wouldn't appreciate it as and much. Your, your kids are eating. Yeah. My kids are eating. Yeah. Not in the car, but they're eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't let that shit happen. No, no I, I still got, I got a coupe and I still got a four seater just in case I had to take the kids. Yeah. But the decision was not based on the kids itself. The yeah. last vehicle, the kids were were a factor. Were a factor. I mean, I felt like bringing them and asking them if for they people like who don't know, Kane, what is your car? What is your new car? You have to let people know. All right, 2012 C63 AMG Mercedes, Woo-wee! and it's fast. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it sounds like a snarling jaguar. Yes. Not the car jaguar, like an actual jungle yeah, creature yeah. that hides in high canopies. And yeah, the best, the best analogy that growls. I've heard so far is it sounds like a Harley Davidson. It does, actually, yeah. You know, that's the best yeah, analogy yeah. I've heard. But, yeah, I, uh, I, heard, I, I didn't even really drive the car, test drive it. I just heard the sound, and I was like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> you're it. Yeah, you're it. You're it. The yeah. M6 was the other one. Now, that's a great car, too, but. I, yeah. So it, you a bit of a motorhead? A little bit, a little bit. I mean, uh I've always kind of liked the whole speed, fast, you know, race car type thing. But at right. the same time, you know, I mean, I also like the, I like the luxury too. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of the nice thing about my car is that I still get the luxury, um, but I also get the performance as well too. Word, word. So let's go back a little bit here and, and talk about, you know, what, what do you think has, obviously there's some natural talents that you've had, but what do you think has allowed you to create yourself mentally and physically to be so dominant in a highly competitive sport like that? Like what are the practices, habits, you know, things that you go through that you think really separate yourself besides, you know, any natural abilities that you have? Um, I mean, obviously practice. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, you know, without that, I mean, you're only as, what do they say, what, you're only as good as how much you practice or yeah, and it something takes, like that. And, you know, 10,000 hours to be a master. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, of things like I, that. I don't know, you know, unfortunately, I didn't keep a log of how many times <laughs> I, and how many hours and days. And, but, uh, you know, I do know that, you know, from ages eight to about 19 or 20, I mean, I spent almost 10 hours a day on the court and that's, yeah. and, and, and by myself. Um, you know, it wasn't a lot of my practicing and I think that that's kind of where I kind of propelled myself above everyone else. Cause I so kind of from, taught myself from eight to 20, 10 hours a day by yourself on a racquetball court. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like people are just listening and thinking, Oh yeah, yeah. No, you don't understand. It's a fucking empty court, not a box, yeah, and, but it and, feels like a and box. And we didn't have iPods yeah, back there either. Nothing, just quiet, just, just the sound of the ball banging off the wall. And you're there by yourself. Mm-hmm. It's like the longest session of athletic masturbation that you yeah. could possibly generate. Yeah, with no climax. <laughs> <laughs> with no climax at the end. At the end. Very true, very true. But so what, I mean, what kind of, I mean, to imagine that, you have to think, this guy's got to be mad. He's got to be crazy got to be nuts what would propel a young lad like yourself to to want to do that i mean what was going through your head at that point well you know um i got into it from my dad Mm -hmm. so uh, i started playing racquetball when i was two years old so i mean you know when i finally reached like eight or nine i mean i was almost a veteran at my club you know which is kind of funny you know and i always played older guys and and uh but for the most part it was just one of those things that you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I didn't grow up with a lot of those royalties that, you know, some, you know, some people do. And, you know, though at the time going through it, I look at it and I go, man, it sucked. But now it was kind of my getaway. 
you know it was yeah. kind of my um what my friends wanted to go and party and do that don't get me wrong i did my fair share of party and there's no right. doubt but when it was time to get down to business you know i was at the court and you know i would miss high school parties i'd miss you know i miss my i miss my prom or whatever you want to call it because i you know i had a tournament you know mm -hmm. i mean uh um, I had to do community service one time and I missed my court hearing when I was younger, you know, we got in trouble as little kids and yeah. I missed my court hearing because I was at a tournament, yeah. you know? So, I mean, it was just one of those things that, you know, it just, it was kind of my way to just get away from everything and what better way than getting into the court and bashing a ball around as hard as you it's can. It's kind of a meditation. You know, I was, I was a basketball player and even still to this day, you know, just going out and shooting some hoops on a quiet court by myself is really calming. You know, it's like a it moment, something about it's it. a moment to like, let your mind kind of unwind and you know, you know what you're doing and you're just kind of focused on what your body's doing. And it's really quite peaceful at that level. But yeah. you know, then again, there has to be, while that may take you for the first hour or two, then there has to be a crazy drive to push yourself to practice past that. Yeah, no, you know, past I, that moment. I agree. I mean, when I was eight, nine, ten, like I won. When I was ten years old, I won uh, world champ, junior world championships, and stuff. Like, I mean, and how old was that? How old did that go up to? Well, it, I mean, you can play eight and under to sixteen, eighteen and under. But excuse so me. So when you were ten, how what were you? Who were you competing against? I was competing against other 10 year olds oh, okay. in the world championships, right. junior world championships. Right. But as far as to overall competition, I was competing against 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 20 year olds. I mean, in my first tournament, it was when I was four years old, I played Lady C. And, uh, and then I won my first tournament when I was five. You, so you were five years old and you played in a ladies yeah. C level. Yeah. So, and they were all like, you know, 25 or above. Some of them were and did 40. You get, did you get to bang them after you beat them? Was that the rule? No, 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 no. I, I, I Unfortunately, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't think I was old enough. Maybe my dad. <laughs> maybe my dad. I don't know. So he collected the, the bounty for you? Yeah, he think, owes me, by the way. Yeah, because I think that's how ladies see racquetball works, actually. It's, yeah, I think so, too. You beat them, and then you get to mount them. Yeah, well, like it's kind of the C rules. part of it, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um Wow, man, what a crazy, what a crazy situation. So then, a um, lot of practice. So that's one. A lot factor. of practice. Yeah, that's one factor. I had, now I did have a huge advantage though. My grandma lived across the street from the racquetball club, mm -hmm. like literally across the street. So that was a huge advantage. My dad would drop me off at my grandma's house, and I would walk over to the club. And so, you know, in the morning I'd go hit. You know, usually about seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. Now, this is, of course, not when I was 10, 11, 12. Right, I mean, it was yeah, more yeah. like when I was 15, 16 and sure. decided that this was going to be my job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, seven, eight in the morning, you know, eight in the morning. I go until about 11 o'clock, whether it's lifting weights, running, swimming, whatever it was. And then I'd go back to my grandma's and have a little bit of lunch, watch some TV and go back. And from one o'clock to about nine o'clock, you know, I'd be, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, you know, it's when you say 10 hours a day, I mean, there was a, you know, little lulls in between and stuff, but still, I mean, overall, you know, an average of 10 hours a day and it just, I never got bored of it. It was yeah. just, uh, you know, one of those things I just really, really enjoyed. And, and of course, you know, it was a, uh, it was a good little bonding, you know, thing from my, for me and my dad too. So that was kind of good. And then of course you reach the age where hanging out with your dad isn't cool anymore, <laughs> you know, like drop me right. off a block away right, right, and right. all that fun stuff, you know? Um, so, you know, we, we kind of started playing. He, but he always said that he was going to retire when I beat him. And it definitely came quicker than what he expected. <laughs> like, shit, I'm not ready to retire. <laughs> yeah, shit is probably, you know, the, the nicest word you could use. <laughs> you know, he, uh, I, it, I think it was about 15 years old that I uh -huh. beat him. And, uh, and so he was a professional. No, he was never professional. He never played any professional tournaments. Uh -huh. He was... He was ranked pretty high in Canada. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it wasn't, you know, I never like pushed him win national titles or anything, but also he never, he was just a local guy at the club that just brought his son and we just played and played local tournaments and, and, uh, you know, I had a chance to go to world championships. So he took me to junior world championships and then I won and I got approached by a company for, you know, free equipment and kind of just all snowballed from there. from there. Yeah. It's funny because I never, when I look back on it, I never, there was never one point where I said to myself, 
this is what I want to do when I get older. I don't, it, it's really weird. Like, I mean, you just got on the train tracks and kind of, yeah. It was like, you know, I quit, I actually quit racquetball to play hockey when I was 11 years old uh -huh. and I played hockey until about 14. And then my dad talked me into playing again. There was a tournament coming up, local tournament. He asked me to play and I said, sure, why not? So I played a couple of times when we went and we won. I kind of caught the bug a little bit again. Yeah. I was like, ah, this is pretty cool. I got to see all the old, you know, all the friends again, all the old guys, right, you know, right, it's right. kind of cool. And, uh, I was like, oh, I'll start playing a little bit more. Well, a year after I started playing again, I go to my Canadian senior nationals and I win. And yeah. next thing you know, I'm, I'm a carded. So here I am 16 years old, making $30,000 tax free money a year. And I'm on the national team. I get to go travel around the world and play for Team Canada. And, uh -huh. I mean, it just kind of all happened. And it was like, well, I guess I'll just, I guess I'll just kind of ride this wave until, you know, it's no sure. more. And, well, here you are. still on that wave, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> here you are. So how much longer do you think you got, uh, you got in this crazy sport here? You know, uh, that's, one of the th that's one of kind of the unknowns, you know, about uh, sports in general. I mean, yeah. You know, to, I could go, you know, do my training session after we're done this and I could hurt myself and never step on the court again. Or, right. I mean, we could be sitting here so 15 barring, years. Yeah, barring injury, you know, I mean, how long do you think you'll still have the drive to, to be competing and, and still doing it? As long as my kids live in my house. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you're, <laughs> you're, you're still putting food in their mouth, huh? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I love what I do. And yeah. that's a huge advantage. Um, I would have to say not a lot of people in this world can say they love what they, what they do for a living. And mm -hmm. I absolutely love what I do. Now, I don't love traveling. I loved traveling when I was, you know, no kids. And I just me and my wife, you know, sure. it was easier. Um, so the traveling's a little bit much. But, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll just try and take care of my body as best as I can. And, and obviously, you know, I put a little bit of burden on you for that too. You know, you That's got all it. the magic right. product. We got you know? on it taking care of you now. That's so you right. Go, so you could be winning championships into your fifties. All right. Well, let's do this when I'm fifty-five. <laughs> and you know, maybe. So, so how many how many world championships do you have in a row? Seven. Seven in a row. In a row. Yeah. So your one loss in four years ago didn't wasn't in the world championships. No. So it's what it is is it has a there's X amount of tournaments, so twelve tournaments. Uh huh. And it's an accumulative point system. So oh, okay, every yeah. turn, so it's like, like skiing, tennis. Like it's, skiing or we've tennis, kind of yeah. adopted a similar ranking system as um, tennis. Right. And so you play all the tournaments and then, you know, add up all the points and you right. get your total and that's it. So it's not like, you know, you lose one tournament and Right. So there's you're not done. one playoff, so to speak. No, no. no so, it's, so you basically maintain world number one, been crowned the champion seven years running. Yes. When? Like Federer has nothing on me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I hope know. he's listening. That's a challenge. <laughs> now that's a challenge to Feder. What's up, Feds? You listening? Yeah, you listening. I'm actually going to take, take this on, racket right here. Take it to the hardwood. Yeah, I do have a. Nice, you mind if I beat him with I his have own a, racket? I have a signed Federer racket next to a signed Kane racket. Yeah, I. Right here. I think I should probably take that racket and see maybe if I can beat him with his own racket. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think you should. So yeah, you actually you should play with uh you play a bit of tennis, right? A little bit, a little bit. If you hit with his racket, you're like, what the fuck is he hitting with? He strings his racket so impossibly loose. Like, really? impossibly loose. Huh. I, I don't know what the string tension is on that. So do I, it's, actually. It's, crazy, it's funny. A lot, yeah, a lot, of people, um, a lot of people in racquetball string their rackets between you know, 35 and 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, when I was a little younger and I was a little more reckless and swinging all crazy, I was down to 29 at one point for my string tension but now i'm you know now i'm a little older and things hurt a little <laughs> more and right, right you know not saying anything but you know it's the truth yeah. you know i get a few more aches and pains than i normally you know would have when i was younger that's how it happens but uh you know it's <laughs> it's one of those things it's uh you know for me um the whole the whole relation for tennis and and racquetball is is i get that all the time when i'm when i'm uh, at tournaments you play tennis a little bit you know yeah <laughs> no do you not see where you are right now yeah, yeah, yeah. you know this is what i do this is yeah, my th job this yeah. Is, yeah like you know but I, I i actually i love watching tennis like uh -huh. did you watch the australian you know? a bit oh man i mean 
I'm I'm a fan of Feder yeah. without a doubt. I'm a fan of Feder. Yeah. I mean, he smooth, just and his mental toughness too is pretty. It's pretty well, phenomenal. he's kind of like the same. Like, you know, I mean, he has really no more to accomplish. I mean, every, I mean, it's like we go back to the self motivating thing, you well, know. Well, but at least he has rivals to push him, you know? true. Like, it's that is oh, true. Oh, shit, it's Federer and Nadal, and everybody gets all fired up. And you know, Nadal's gonna bring the stink, you know, he's gonna run around, he's gonna do his thing. Same with Djokovic, you know, like these guys are like pushing him, you know, which, which true. In, in, in a lot of ways makes it easier. Yeah, but at some point, you know, there was a point where no one yeah, really no was, one was either. Him. And I'm sure that point is going to come for me, too. I'm, I'm sure. And, you know, I, like, I joke around with people all the time because I say, you know what? All I'm doing is I'm just trying to delay the inevitable. That's all I'm trying to do, you know, because yeah. eventually it's going to happen, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy pill for me to swallow. <laughs> you know, I, How much do you detest losing? Well, it's going to sound bad, but... I've actually forgotten what it feels like <laughs> to lose. Like, and I know that I know that's like the and, best. That's the best shit talking line. I use that occasionally. Yeah. Like yeah. I'll lose something. I'll be like, man, thank you for reminding me what it feels yeah, and like see, to lose. Let's play again. It sounds so bad. It really does. It's, it sounds horrible, but it's the truth. Like, um, I, the closest I can say is when I don't play good. Yeah. You know, I, so I, how I hard get, on yourself then when you don't play good, what's your own, you know, I mean, well, but you're still winning. That's the thing. It's like way easier to be brutal on yourself when you miss a shot and you lose. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to lie. It's tough. You know I mean? You, you, most people, they win. They think they do everything right. Right. And so why do I need to analyze it? I won. Right. You know, but for me, I, uh, holding yourself to your own internal standard. Yeah. I, you know, I look, I have high standards for myself and Trust me, I know what I can and what I can't do. And there's not too much that I can't do on a racquetball court. Sure. And, um, you know, I think also, too, with all that being said, no one will ever outsmart me on the court either. I think mm -hmm. that's another reason why I haven't been beaten or even pushed for a while is because, you know, there's a lot of little scenarios that happen in 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 the mat in one match of racquetball you know you gotta you come out with your game plan it doesn't work you know when you're playing great it's real easy to just ride that way but mm -hmm. when you're not playing good how do you change it you know maybe some shots you know one of your you know couple of shots your bread and butter you're not hitting you got to change it how is your opponent playing you know maybe he's returning a serve better one day and he's not returning a, a different serve better i mean it's it, so there's a lot of little scenarios that play out and you know, that's when the that's when the, the, the mental side of it and knowing, you know, when to make the right changes and, and uh you know, and you go back to Federer. I mean yeah. that's part of Federer's well. success. He does I mean, that well. And every you, see, you know, you see people not abiding by that a lot. It, I, you see it in fighting, you know, I mean in, in MMA. You'll see someone come out with just a bad strategy and not change. Mm -hmm. You know, like they'll try something for the first round, not working at all. You know, they went away from their strength. They're doing something weird. And you're like, okay, like make the adjustment. And even sometimes the corner will be like, hey, make the adjustment. And they just won't do it. Yeah, you which know, is a bad trait, every, but a good see, trait too. It's yeah. like you're sticking to your game plan, but it's not working. So you got to. There's the balance. Yeah, you got to know when to stick with it and when to abandon ship and try something new. Yeah, and, you know? and, and in defense to that person who just sticks with their game plan, it could work too. I mean, you know, it could turn <laughs> it around could. and it could it could all it of a could. sudden change. That's the beautiful part about sports. But for the most part, you have to be willing to change. That's another thing. You have to be willing to change it too. You know, right. so it's Just like not not overly stubborn. Either. Yeah. Well, I mean, I remember. I mean, I've been watching. You know, I've been watching UFC ever since. You know, Hoist Gracie and mm -hmm. you know all those guys. And you know, it's funny because you'd always see at the beginning of the UFC when it first started. To me, it was like. They were one dimensional. You had the you strikers, know, you had the, the strikers, grapplers, you right. had the grapplers, you had the boxers, the street fight, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, and now, you know, and it's slowly, you know, you look at Chuck Liddell, you know, and then you look, you know, those type of guys, like he was I think what he would be, still be fighting now if he kind of changed the style a little bit, got on the ground a little not saying yeah. he can't, but now fighters are so versatile they have every part sure. of their you gotta game. be completely well-rounded exactly yeah. and that's just how sports evolves you know and and even in racquetball you can see it you know um past champions they always had one or two great things that they always had 
But they had weaknesses. But they had weaknesses. And a savage like yourself can exploit those weaknesses. That's right. That's right. But <laughs> well, I got to be smart enough to... to yeah, to... no, I hear you. And, and I want to go back to one thing you said about holding yourself to your own standard. I think that's a real, you know, trait of successful people. You know, I've, I'm happen to be good friends with Bodie Miller, who's the most successful U.S. skier in history. And, <clears throat> you know, he'll finish a race... Win or loss, it doesn't matter. If he wins or he loses, he judges himself on how he skied that race. Mm -hmm. The result is inconsequential to his own feeling of pride or, um, you know, wanting to look back and change something. You know, it's it's funny. You know, I've seen him win races and be like, yeah, this is bullshit. Let's get out of here. You know, because he didn't ski the way he wanted to ski. And I've seen him ski and lose and be like, I fucking brought it today. I was on it. Yeah. You know, and, and, I would, and, you know, to him, that was the most important thing. A lot of times victory does correlate with, you know, the performance that you're happy with, but sometimes it doesn't, you know, and I think even in, in non-athletics, you know, I've, I've kind of found the same thing. You know, I've now my business endeavors are, let's say I'm doing a podcast, you mm -hmm. know, and I can have 20 people say, Oh, I'll be, man, that was an awesome podcast. Like, so, but I'll know myself if I was sharp, if I brought up what I wanted to bring up, if I was present, if I was in the moment, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of the result, you know, I know internally how well I did. And same day, same when I show up at work every day, Yeah, you know, and, and that's, that's it, you know, and in some previous business endeavors, I was externally successful, you know, and I would have people congratulate me on my position but I never would, I never like was able to take that in, you know, just yeah, because I, I knew I hadn't brought everything that I could. To yeah. The table. I mean, I'd have to say that even though in these four years I'm undefeated, I would have to say that I've walked off the court disappointed with myself more than I have been happy with myself. You know, the win, uh, I know the feeling of winning. That's not the issue anymore, right, right. you know, but in that whole four years, it's not like I played lights out the whole four years. Right. You know, and so I've been disapp I've walked off the court beating someone in 20 minutes and I turned to my, you know, my wife and I'm like, this is bullshit. Like, <laughs> this is absolutely bullshit. And here's my wife going, what? What, what do you, you want? What do you what, want like, to do? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, get back to the room and I'm all quiet. And she's like, you know, I can't even believe you have this attitude you want. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, I mean. Sometimes I sometimes I win and I don't feel like I should win. Right, right. You know, and I and and even though I win, I doesn't feel like the win just because you know I know I know what I can bring to the table. Yeah. And you know, look, that's the beautiful thing about athletics is that, and you know, it's just you never you never know how you're gonna play from day to day. You know, one day, and that's and that's kind of. You just got to stack the odds in your favor. Well, that's what's you know, so cool, that's, I think, it. about the body itself, the mind and the body. That's where I kind of get a little bit intrigued, you know, is because it's like my, my tournaments generally run Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, on Friday, now, granted, the competition from the first round to the finals is different, but, you know, Friday and Saturday, I bring it, kick the shit out of the guy, bring it, beat him in 15 minutes, and then in the finals, you know, it's mm -hmm. like I'm not seeing the ball right. I, I, you know, I'm not. My stroke doesn't feel good. I'm not hitting the hitting the ball as hard or as crisp. Or, you know, I mean, and that's kind of the intriguing part. To it me, is. No, you know, there's some there's some weird stuff. You know, even for me, who's, you know, I'm supplementing and and doing really good things for my body as much as possible, and kind of been you know working out, you know, really hard since I was, I don't know, like you said, ten or something like that y'all still get surprised in both sides. Like I was in the gym the other day and I've not, I've been traveling a lot. I've been fucking off, you know? So I was expecting the typical like decline in, in strength and ability. And for some weird reason, like you know, I have no idea why I was like stronger than I was six weeks ago, mm -hmm. you know, and the body just somehow some combination of rest and whatever it was that day was allowed yeah. me to do that. And it used to be like that when I was playing playing ball like some days i could get up and dunk the ball and be like yeah right on and then other days i'd go up and like set my focus and, <laughs> and go up to go hammer one and it would be like not even close yeah actually you know, you know what's funny is that that actually happened to me yesterday i mm -hmm. went and hit the ball with my wife and and uh got in there and i hadn't hit the ball for about a week and a half you know mm -hmm. I, I was just kind of 
nursing a couple of injuries and thought, you know, hey, I'll go hit the ball with my wife. No big deal. Got in the court and I started hitting the ball and I was like, I am hitting the fucking shit out of the <laughs> ball right now. And I'm like, I feel so good. And so I hit some forehands, go to the back end, hit some back. I'm like, geez, this is unbelievable. Hit some serves. Wife walks on the court. Hasn't even warmed up yet. My wife didn't even walk onto the court. Walks on the court. I go, I'm done at any time. I can go home anytime. <laughs> my, mo- my wife is like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I, I feel absolutely awesome. Like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I yeah. feel great. I got it. I- it was just like, okay, you know, I still, it was like one of those things, like just that, just being reassured that I know, still know how to do it, you know? Right, but right. It, But sometimes, you know, sometimes that time off, you know, just letting your body heal. And not only that, letting the mind heal too, you know, mm-hmm. take your mind off take of a it a little break. bit. Yeah. You know, you get so engulfed sometimes when it's your, when it's your job, you know, and, and when you do that, then it, then, then you really start looking at it as a job mm-hmm. instead of looking at it as something you as love. A joy. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I've done that more than a couple of times in my career, but of course, you know, um, you know, being the number one player, you have expect people expect certain things from you. Tournament sure. directors expect certain things from you. So, um, and it's the same with people in your job. You know, yeah. whatever you're going to have expectations to live up to. But I think that's a good point is to give yourself a mental break. You yeah, know, I, I think more than the to, physical break, I think yeah. the mental break can be just as good. I mean, uh, my tournament in beginning of November this past year, uh, I was hurt and I didn't touch a racket for two weeks before the tournament. Went to the tournament. And no one got over five points on me. And I walk away from the tournament going, I mean, even, even my, uh, my buddy that was with me, I'm like, I can't, even, I can't even believe we're sitting in the airport. And I'm like, I can't even believe. I look at the scores and I'm like, this is insane. Like, I didn't even touch the ball. I didn't yeah. even touch a racket. I didn't even, I didn't even at home, I didn't even go into my <laughs> racquetball bag and grab the damn racket. Like, right. I didn't even do anything. I, I literally packed my bag, went. No, and I really, I mean, I, th- I really honestly thought that that might have been the time you know, that that someone was going to catch you. Yeah. I mean, I think that every single time I play, you know, I, 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 and that might be because why I I don't lose that often is because I respect everybody I play, Mm -hmm. whether I know I can beat you or can't beat you. When we walk on the court, it's irrelevant. Like they say, that's why we play the game. Right. You know? And so I've, I've tried to make a conscious effort to respect everyone that I play and try as hard as I can. And yeah. um, I've always felt, too, that if I don't, then I'm almost doing a disservice to them as well, too. That's you know, a, that's a yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, because yeah. I know if you, you know, if, you know, you had some of my competitors here talking with us, I mean, they would probably say, I don't want to hear you say that you don't try. No, that's, you that's know, insulting. That's yeah. insulting, you know, and that's not the truth. I mean, it's, I, 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 I try as hard as I can and I, I, I try and bring it every time I step on the court, even if it's for practice. And, and uh, I'm sure that those guys as, you know, mad or upset at that they are, that they're not winning right now. I'm sure they respect it, you know, (laughs) and push, I push them to get, you know, I push them to get a little bit better as well too, you know, that's why, you know, it's, it's funny. I'll, I play a bit of ping pong. I'm sure you do as well. We'll have to tangle. We'll have to tangle in that sport. But, you know, I'll be playing very social games. You know, I have, there's some people I can get super competitive with and just That, and that probably wouldn't be me at yeah. all. <laughs> Not at all. That's, no, we'd probably just be real calm. And, yeah, no, know, I, nice I anticipated game. it'd be a fucking war. Yeah. But then, you know, there's the people who just want to play ping pong with you. And they're still, they still want to be competitive. But if you play it all out, they're just not going to get to hit the ball. So mm-hmm. I'll play left-handed or I'll play with my cell phone as the paddle or something like that. And it's kind of being a, kind of a cocky prick, you know, or a, a frying pan. I beat a lot of people with a frying pan. But it's also a way for me to actually try. Like at that point, then I can try and I can get, it can be like, yeah, I'm no. going full out, you know? Yeah, because you don't want to lose. No. And here you are going, I'm just going <laughs> to grab this bottle here and I'm going <laughs> to beat you with this bottle. And the guy's going, fuck off. And you're yeah. going... This oh my god! I better, that, I better beat him. Like, yeah, this you know? is the only way that this this whole game gets fun on a competitive level. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. So you haven't tried to do that though. You haven't. I pulled, beat someone with a frying pan. <laughs> I did. did. Yeah, on TV. I ha- there's an interview. There's an interview. I I don't know. It's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, I saw it, and I literally. A man of my own heart came. A yeah, man of my own heart. Yeah, it uh, it was actually quite fun. But but mind you, I never once felt threatened, even though it was only a frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's awesome. too similar. It's too similar to a racket. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> but not really that similar. No, no but, but shape wise, I mean, it's got a handle and it's, you know, yeah. I mean, it's Teflon. Yeah. 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 Non stick. Yeah. I don't want the non stick. Yeah. If we play, I'm going to have Mickey's use a fucking cast iron. Then we'll see. Then we'll really see. See if you. All right. Go. I'll do You know what I'll do? I'll do a few more. Uh, I'll do a few more. Uh, Push-ups and sit-ups to get yeah. myself a little stronger. <laughs> uh, that's funny. So when you play, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about, you have like a pre-serve ritual that looks very OCD from the outside going in. So what is it? Is that is that <laughs> some kind of OCD or is it a way to kind of get your mind? You know, why are you doing that? And explain what you do before you serve. Well, you know, it, I believe in routine. Mm-hmm. And the more you can get into a routine, the more comfortable you're going to be. And that's kind of one of the... It's, it, we only have 10 to 15 seconds in between rallies. So in that 10 to 15 seconds, I usually just hit the ball because I feel like every other, every person in sports has a little bit of OCD mm-hmm. uh, to what degree. I don't really know. Absolutely. You know, but, uh, and for, superstition. <laughs> yeah. I used to have that. I don't have it anymore. Good. You rid yourself of that. Yeah. 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 But you know, for the most part, I'm just I'm I'm trying to clear my mind. You know, forgetting about whether I got a bad call or whatever the case may be. Last rally, and just clearing my mind, getting ready, focused. You know, what serve I'm going to hit, um, and that's really it. You know. So you're ba- you bounce the ball off the corners of the racket in a in the same way every time. Mm-hmm. And I've seen you. Do you repeat it if it didn't go exactly? No, no, no. It's just all the same. No, and and so, and. Sometimes I, I mean, it's, I don't do it all the time. Now in, in the early matches, I, I kind of like to overwhelm my opponent. So I don't do that because it's like rally's over. I get into the service box right. and I start serving. Just push and so, the pace, like a no huddle offense. Exactly. Exactly. Cause I know that those guys aren't going to be able to, you know, to keep up. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, in the finals or even in the semifinals, I mean, obviously the competition is better. So, you know, you just want to take that little bit of time to get refocused for whatever, you know, whatever happened the last rally. Sometimes, you know, you get a bad call and it may rattle you a little bit depending on, you know, at what point in the match. And so it's just a little, it's what I do just to kind of clear my mind and, yeah, you know, get ready for what's about to come. It makes sense. So you're almost like, um, you know, I've been reading a lot of book, well, one book in particular, talking about bringing yourself to the zero state. And they're talking about it in a spiritual sense, but also in an athletic sense. That's the state where you're in the zone, where your mind shuts down to a certain degree, and you're just allowing what you know naturally will come, the inspiration that comes from your own knowledge and any kind of higher knowledge and all the training and everything to just act without you interfering. You know, more often than not, I think <clears throat> there is some strategic element to your actual computing brain you know that mm-hmm. you're using and and you kind of yeah. set that up beforehand and you make some analysis and decisions but when you're actually playing and reacting you know the best state in every sport that i've ever participated in is when that part's shut off and yeah you're, you're not thinking you're just a, doing you just you just let that all go and you're nothing you have you know no mind as the zen sword yeah. masters would my, say. my coach is funny because a lot of the times you know we're we're driving you know to the club or to my match or whatever and and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be driving 15 minutes and not one word will be said mm-hmm. and we'll get out of the car and he'll just look at me and he'll just go, I don't even have to ask you if you're ready. <laughs> you know, as soon as I get, you know, talk about that job, I could be your fucking coach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go, that, on, yeah. go on, seriously. <laughs> how hard is it to be that? I mean, I'm sure your coach is a great dude, and I, you know, yeah. but, but I mean, how hard? Or is it to be yeah, well, coach? I guess at this point, not very hard, <laughs> but um, there was a point where, you know, I mean, you know, he did help me with, uh, you know, my serve. My, when I first came on tour, my serve was okay, um, but now it's a real weapon, yeah. you know, and so I have to give it to him. And, you know, the thing is, is that it, it, I understand it's probably pretty tough for him, you know, but, you know, because obviously the goal is winning. And when you're winning, I mean, what do I have to do? Right. right. I mean, that's well, kind of, you still got to you know, push to improve. And that's and, the, that's it. And that's what we've been talking about. And that's you know? exactly right. And, and that's what I love about him. That's what I absolutely love about him is that, you know, he, we work so well together because we're never content. We're never, we're never, we're never comfortable with where we're at. We're never content. We're always trying to push it to that next level. And even he's pushing me to the next level. You know, I'll go to, you know, a tournament, you know, kick everyone's ass. And then here we are, you know, next day sending me a, a, 
a whole page of things that he saw that he thinks I need to work on, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's beautiful. That's, I mean, that's what you want, you know? Absolutely. The, the, day, the day that I have a conversation with him and we go, well, I don't know. You know, I'm, I don't know. I might have to think about picking another profession. <laughs> right. You right. know, that's how I feel. Well, about that day it. will never come, though. You know, no, you keep perfection as the ideal, knowing full well that you'll never attain it. You know, and that's, that's exactly how, that's right. How you stay focused. Yeah, that's ex- that's 100 percent correct. So to go back to that state where you're releasing your mind, <laughs> have you ever studied any Zen philosophy or tried to apply that to other aspects of your life? Or is that mm. something you just do for your racquetball? No, I've always kind of been. I like to. I like to relate things in my life and things that I would like to change and stuff, you know, and, and so how am I trying to say it? It's, it's, I, I, I start to think about, you know, sometimes when, you know, when I'm at a tournament, you know, I think about how, when I was nobody, mm-hmm. you know, and everybody, or even when I started winning and everybody said, oh, he's not going to be the greatest. He's not going to be the best player in the world or, you know, and I, I mean, those are the motivating factors for me, but you know, I've never really, I've never really sat back and thought about it really all that much. I mean, it's just kind of, I don't know. It just, I kind of am a believer of just letting it happen, you know? Well, and, that's the essence of Zen itself. And it's, that's Zen applied to Zen. Whoa, you're going deep here. Whoa, okay? no, you're going a little <laughs> deep here. <clears throat> well, speaking of going deep, we got 10 minutes here left on the Warrior Poet Podcast. And the last few minutes we got to talk about on it. Because I know you've been, uh, you've been pumped about using some of those products and stuff. Yeah. But we got seven minutes. And, you know, I have to drag you into some, deep, some deeper waters here because you specially requested that from me beforehand. So, so I, let's talk about what are, your, what are your spiritual beliefs here, King? Spiritual beliefs? Yeah. Man. What happens when you die? Uh, what happens when you die? I won't be number one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, <laughs> true. Um, you know, I've ne- you know, it's interesting, but I haven't really ever given it much thought. You know, it's like. So, what about the fear of death? Do you have? Do you carry with you a fear of death, or is that just something that's? I not I, a I fear either? death now because I'm a parent, right? And I want to see my kids grow up, and I want to see them get married, and I want to be a grandpa and stuff like that. But uh, you know, I think it's when it's your time, it's your time, and and uh, you know, I don't think that there's. You know, everything happens for a reason, you know, and sometimes well, that that's reason... that's a spiritual belief in itself. Yeah, so, and... I, and so, so what is causing everything to happen for a reason, Kay? You know, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I don't know. you just I've ne- it. You know what? I've never really gotten this deep, especially with a guy before. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're talking. You don't like those visions of boxes, so who knows? Who knows, Kay? True, true. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, I when I was younger, I just believed that when you die, it's... It's done, you know, and in the dirt, feeding worms. in the dirt, that's it. That's done. And I think that, uh, as I've gotten a little older, I've wanted to believe more yeah. that there's life after death and, sure. you know, and I, um, I think more so now, um, I had a, one of my favorite dogs pass away just this past year and, and I never really looked at it like this, but I was like, you know, one day I'll see you again. And I found myself sitting there going, okay, hold on here. You know, Disney says that all dogs go to heaven. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, for me, you know, it was like I never really thought about like the afterlife, you know, but then when 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 she died, I was kind of like, you know, that's okay. One day I'll one day I'll see you again. It'll be, you know, but where my beliefs before were kind of more along the lines of and it's just just over, you know. Um, So, I, you know, I guess, you know, in that sense, I guess I've kind of changed a little bit, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it hasn't been a dominant force in your life. It doesn't, you know, the fears, the things don't really detract. And it's just kind of, it seems like an open-minded agnostic is how you've, yeah, kind of. as you would, you would talk about it. Yeah. And I think that's probably a better way to be because the more you try to choke down other people's philosophies, uh, the more bullshit you're yeah, choking I, along I with think, it. I think that, I think that the process of growing up, you, 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 come to the conclusion with your own beliefs and you, 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 you start believing, you know, as, as things transpire in your life, as things go on, you know, you kind of take on your own belief system. I Absolutely. Mean, and I know? think that's the key core to anything that's true. And what all of the, the shamans that you see, what all the experiential spirituality will teach you is you don't need to listen to anything, you know, anything that's true, you can find out for yourself, mm-hmm. you know, so all this talk about read these words and have faith. You know, mm-hmm. bullshit. If you can't feel it and see it yourself somehow, 
you know, maybe you're not quite capable yet, but if you went on that path to see it and use the proper tools, you know, to see that you could experience the same truth and come to the same conclusions. And I think that is the ultimate litmus test for true spirituality. Can you come to those same conclusions if given the right circumstances, given the right motivation? And uh, if the answer to that is no, then it's probably not true. Yeah, I I don't know. I've always, you know, my parents always kind of said, you know, uh, do what you believe in, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's always been hard for me to hear someone else speak about their beliefs and then kind of ride those coattails. <laughs> right. You know, it's always kind of been, for yourself. you know, I mean, I don't know. And, and, and just because I believe one thing doesn't mean that you're going to believe the same thing. Now there might be people that out that believe the same thing as I do, but I mean, you know, I think that just overall things that transpire in our life and the process of growing up and the people you surround yourself with, you know, it kind of gives you your own, you know, kind of, spiritual beliefs if you you know and and that's kind of how i've done it i've never really sat down and thought about it really you right. know well you haven't done enough mushrooms then yeah probably not <laughs> that's <laughs> only that's, shroom tech uh, yeah only shroom tech yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, nice yeah. segue and man. they're kind and they're like kind of magic you're like a professional radio guy almost here. almost, yeah, yeah. almost. So, so let's talk about we got five minutes left let's talk about uh you know some of the honor products that you've been trying out because you know of course uh this podcast is sponsored by on it.com o-n-n-i-t.com where you can get some fine supplements that badass world record holding racquetball champion seven time but let's make it clear just because you take lost in four years people will also be taking along with you at the same time that's exactly right yes but however just because you take it doesn't mean that you're going to come and beat me either okay (laughs) so i i believe in your product but uh, you know it's not a magic berry dust pill yeah no it's it's not no so how but how's it helped you what are are some of the products you've enjoyed and interacted with well i i'd have to say that well you know this as well i do one of my favorites is the tonka bar oh the tonka bar he loves the tonka oh those things are unbelievable (laughs) Uh, unreal i could live on those things yeah so what is it you like so much about those tonka bars they're a great company by the way i'm just in touch with those guys and a really conscious company the way that they're making it very keen on tradition and a cool company. Well, first of all, I love beef jerky. Right? I love right. beef jerky. I love those beef products like that. So, you know, honestly, if you sat here and told me it does nothing for you, I'd still like it just as much. Well, you no, know? I mean, it's just it's protein so, and nutrients. It's pro- food. It's yeah, food. It's yeah. straight up food. It, it's just, uh, it's for me, it's a really good product for after I'm done playing. Yeah. You know, Quick I'm, snack. I don't mind shakes. But I'm more of like, I need solid. I need something, you know, <laughs> something I mean, eat, yeah. you know, the shake is great and everything. But, you know, maybe one day when I got no teeth and I'm old, you know, I'll worry <laughs> about, you know, liquid diets. Yeah. Um, so I really like that bar. And obviously the taste is absolutely phenomenal. Uh-huh. Um, one of the other uh, two of the other products I really, really enjoy is the new mood and the um, the immune, the shroom tech immune. Yep. Uh, I've actually. um given the immune shroom tech immune to friends and they've been really really sick and within two or three days and you Boom. know so i feel like i feel like i'm i'm like you know pushing it on i'm like take it take it you're you like know? a doctor you're gonna get better you know and uh, like a doctor as yeah. joey diaz would say <laughs> like a doctor um the new mood um the way i wake up in the morning with the new mood especially after having a long day of training and you know of course and my kids wake me up at five in the morning. Doesn't yeah, matter. So yeah. it doesn't matter what time I go to bed or they go to bed. They're up right. at five in the morning. So the new mood actually really helps me because I wake up feeling awesome. Yeah. I it's mean, pretty remarkable how you know how you can get a little bit of sleep, but if it's a new mood, you know, night and uh you'll feel like you've gotten a lot more sleep. Then. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to I mean I try and take it every night and but I really focus on taking it after a long, hard day sure. where I know for a fact that the next day when I have to wake up, it's going to be absolutely horrible. And, and uh, you know, I'm not really a coffee drinker, so I don't Well, know. maybe you just haven't tried our bulletproof coffee. No, I haven't. I haven't. Try that. See, that's we'll on you, you right we'll there, by the way. I know. We'll get you hooked <laughs> up. We got all kinds of new stuff. We're dropping new shit at on it like every week. It's crazy. The next two months are nuts, man. I know. You know what else is really good? The Killer Bee Honey. The kill- yeah, stuff's good. That huh? shit is screaming (laughs) that is that's pretty good i so so when you gave me the product right i i said okay 
you know, he, he says that it's the best honey I'll ever taste. So what did I do? I went to Central Market and I bought me some honey. Yep. And I thought, you were, I thought you were lying and you weren't. <laughs> uh, you weren't. You were actually being honest. Yeah. You know, it is it, great. No, 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 they, no. They know how to pollinate. They yeah, kill. they'll kill you and, and they'll pollinate they'll you. They'll pollinate you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the other? What's the, what's the other one? Uh, uh, the alpha, alpha brain. brain. I take the alpha brain. Now, see, the alpha brain and the, and the shroom tech sport, I first started taking, I did like two little, like little experiments, so mm-hmm. to speak. Okay. So I didn't really, t- I, I didn't really take it every day. Mm-hmm. So at, when I first started, Taking it, I took it right before racquetball matches. Mm-hmm. It f- made me feel phenomenal. I mean, I, I would have to say the thing that I enjoyed the most was the clarity mm-hmm. of the way I saw the ball, my reaction time, yeah. uh, stuff like that. And then um, I was like, you know, let me see what it's like taking it for a couple of weeks. And I think that just overall, um, I mean, it's just a good product. It I is. mean, it, I, I don't. I mean, I could sit here and try and sell you on a bunch of stuff, but it's just a good product. It's a product that you can take when you need it, or it's a product that you can take every day if you want. Hell yeah! I mean, That's what better is that? I mean, you know, most the mo- just vary the dose a little bit. That's what I do. You know, there's like I have like a maintenance dose of Alpha Brain See, one now- to two, and then if I'm really if I got to be focused, like I'm going on the Rogan podcast or something like that, then I'm, I'm bumping it up. I'm taking three. Well, see, you almost, you almost made me feel like a junkie in a way because like... Yeah, your dose is savage. Don't even mention how many. He's, uh, he's pushing AJ Hawk for the most I, amount of... I am. Most well, I was. I was. I was. <laughs> you know, uh, w- here's the thing. When I started taking it for the two weeks, after about a week and a half, I was like, You're I got to up this. And I, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and of course, you know, you scared me when you said, well, you know... Don't take too much because if you do, then, you know, you, you could feel like you ever smoke a cigar before and you yeah. get that feeling. And I'm like, yeah, that's like yeah. the worst feeling in the yeah, world, yeah. you know. You got to watch out with the alpha brain. You get a almost like a yeah. nicotinic reaction. But at one point I was uh, four and four. Yeah, I was that's, four that's alpha strong. brains and four you know, shroom tech sport. I got I to say that I've, I've tried to limit my shroom teching to four, but occasionally I'll take five. And I'm like a man possessed. Oh I'll like gosh. finish a full body workout and like go buy a leg press machine and be like, Oh shit! I can do some leg presses. Yeah, you, you, I've never had that thought ever. You know, finish a brutal kettlebell workout, do some other training, and then walk by a leg press and be like, "Oh, that looks good." Only Shroom Tech can get me to have that thought. You yeah, know? And that's you get the that. Truth, you know, I, I, you know, you get that vibrating feeling throughout your whole body. <laughs> right. Like you know, never mind the cigar feeling. You yeah. feel you know it's. Um, but yeah, those you know those products for playing have been unbelievable. And of course, you know, I go back to the new mood. That's really important for me. Yeah especially when I'm traveling and also to the immune too. Yeah. I mean that those two products are great for me just in the traveling, you know, getting to tournaments, you know, wanting to, you know, having to wake up early, you know, getting ready for the match, you know, later in the day. Um, just that feeling of waking up, you know, brand new yeah. is, is a, is a good feeling. I hear you brother. Is well, it, that's been a, uh, that's a wrap for us. That's here, it. Kane. That's it, man. We can't hour, go no it, longer. That hour goes fast. We That's can't go no man. longer. Nah, nah, it's a one hour podcast. Man. Oh, man. I ain't Joe Rogan. I can't talk for three hours. I'm not high enough. All right. Hey, Joe, call me if you need anyone. <laughs> um, uh, an hour right. isn't yeah, good enough for me. <laughs> All right, my brother. So if people want to Google you, it's Kane, K A N E, Wasselinchuk. Let me try this W A S E L E N C H U K. Yes, that's it. Boom. Boom, bitches. I got it. So Google him. Check out some of his matches. It's pretty sick. It's pretty insane stuff. YouTube. YouTube, YouTube as well. Yeah. I think you can get Well, you. Google will get you to YouTube. Are you sure? Usually. I think they're the same company. But Yeah, maybe you might want to stay away from my name. I don't know what comes <laughs> up when you get my name up there, you know? Uh, you never know. Just stay off the other kind of I wasn't the best right. kid when I was younger, so you never know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my brother. Well, thanks for stopping by. Much love and uh, keep kicking ass. Thanks, we'll man. Appreciate it. I had every, fun. Uh, every once in a while. You better, and... you better call me to do this again. Hell yeah. All right, good. Just the beginning. All right, I'm going to hold you All to All right. That. All right, man. Okay. All right, thanks.